this session, like all this conversation, <laughs> uh, like I said, is titled The Designer and Their Brand, The Power of Storytelling. And so I'm going to introduce Tebe Ikala Feng Ford. He's going to do a 20-minute presentation, after which I'll invite the rest of the team. So Tebe Ikala Feng is a recognized and award-winning brand builder. He has held marketing leadership positions in SA and the USA. In a six-year tenure as executive director respons responsible for marketing at Nike Africa, he led the organization to win 75 local and international marketing and communications awards, including eight Can Lions and the IMM Marketing Organization of the Year Role of Honor. A seasoned keynote speaker, author, and academic, he has addressed all major brand and branding conferences and blue chip organizations such as National Brands. He has also written for leading brands and branding journals and publications and lectures part-time at Wits University. Please, with a warm round of applause, let us welcome Thebe Ikalafeng. Good afternoon, uh, Nigeria. Good afternoon, Lagos. Good afternoon. You guys should be awake now. It's what time? It's uh, 10 to 6. You've been up for at least 20 hours now, right? So I'm going uh, to uh, take, you, uh, take you a little bit uh, through my, my views in terms of uh, how as Africans we need to be building brands and what we've done and uh, just share some experiences uh, uh, from, around, uh, from around the continent. So you all remember, you all remember um, 1890, I think 1884 uh, when the white people came to the continent, right? They were sitting in Belgium. They were talking about us, cutting us into little pieces, uh, which country they like, where they want to get the gold, where they want to get the people, uh, just taking advantage of us, right? And after all that is done, they looked at us and they said, this continent is useless. You know, they look at us, they say, Africa's woes, Africa, agony of Africa, this continent is a hopeless continent. But this, our continent is rising, as you know. It's a fast rising continent. Uh, and, you know, I've been to every single country in the continent. In the last three years, I've been, I probably did 30 countries uh, across the continent. And I've learned a few things on that, on, uh, on that journey. The one thing that you know about our continent is that we are making money. Uh, the, our people are consuming, we are urbanizing fast, we are making babies. You know, they say by 20, uh, 2050, uh, we will have made enough babies. We won't need to go any other country, our, our continent anyway. We've got our own labor here and everything we want. But most importantly, we are at peace. We're a peaceful continent and everybody wants to come and eat here. Everybody wants to come and eat from Africa. They want to eat. And when they eat here, they call us names. They call us shed whole countries. Uh, and we know who they are, right? They make products and they remind us of slavery. Uh, and we go around because we, we don't learn, right? We go around, we go to Gucci and we go to Prada. We buy their products irrespective of what, what they say. Um, slow down. <laughs> they make products and, you know... Uh, Dolce & Gabbana, I mean, for 2,395, they launched a sandal and they call it the slave sandal. And they expect us to buy it. And we go around buying them, right? And they call us a bunch of monkeys. And we go and buy their products. And they talk here, they said, you know, we're helping women to reconsider and redefine beauty. But what they mean is, you know, uh, with their soap, we're going to go from our beautiful melanin to another color we don't like. Yeah? They copy our ideas and they send them all over the, uh, Europe. But I don't know, do you guys recognize us back? We're in Lagos, we should recognize that. When them Ghanaians came here and we wanted to kick them out, what did we say? Ghana must go. And then I tell you this back, when you look at this back, and this back reminds us of, I mean, everybody, even the Nigerians, they use it. The Chinese, they use it. Every single country, because this back can pack it all in, right? Uh, you can put a lot of stuff in this stuff. And I'll tell you what, when they, slow down, when, they, um, when, when the Louis Vuitton took this bag and put it on the ramp, what did the Africans say? Ah, now I can proudly carry my Ghana must go to the airport without people pitying me. So we waited for them to tell us it's a good bag. But we knew the bag should be good because it's ours, right? And, you know, Prince Harry came to Africa riding uh, 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 in Lesotho, uh, wearing the blankets, you know, they look at these, they're like, oh, these Basotos, are they not too hot with blankets in the middle of summer? 
But I tell you, when Louis Vuitton put the blanket on the ramp, the Africans were running for $3,000 and 3,000 euros. They said, I need to get myself that blanket uh, because, they, uh, because as an African, I must afford it. For $3,000, you could have gone to Lesotho and bought it for $50. But just when they put the label of Louis Vuitton, you're quite excited to put it on. You know, they look at this, they're like, ah, I want to jump like that. Those are like a Maasai, you know, because we think it's funny, right? And when they put the stuff on the, on the ramp, we're like, oh, Louis Vuitton again. They put it on the ramp. And we now are running. We don't think of Maasai as tourist attractions. We're now thinking uh, these are the people which we're buying stuff from. You know, when you ask an African man uh, what they see there, they're like, I see a proper woman. They say, that's how a woman should look. And you know, when everywhere else around the world, uh, you go to JLo, everybody, they are busy breaking their back. They want to get that thing that our mamas gave us for free, right? They are putting things inside there just to blow it up. And our mamas gave it for free, right? And then I'll tell you, when Levi put this, and Levi created this gene, this gene that could accommodate Kilimanjaro. Uh, and everybody says, "Woo, Levi is a good brand. So, you know, folks, here's a scorecard. This is what's happened because of all these things that have been happening. So every year for the last eight years, I've been conducting a study across the continent to look at what are the most admired brands in the continent. And this is what we found. We found, we found that 83% the, of the brands that Africans admire are non-African. We don't love ourselves. If you, if you tell people it's made in Nigeria, they're like, oh, don't you have something from Italy? Something from Paris? If you say it's made in Kenya, they're like, oh, not good. 83% of us do not love made in Africa. We've done the survey now for eight years in a row. So the results have stood around that, uh, around that for a long time. And if we look at some of the brands they admire, Nike, Adidas, Samsung, Coca-Cola, Techno, Puma, you know these, these brands, right? That's the brands that they love, that we love as Africans. You look at the number one brand in every country in the continent, 83% non-African. You only see like, well, there's an MTN there, there's a TNM, there is... Um, uh, there's an uh, Ethiopian brand somewhere. Oh, there's Econet from Zimbabwe. There's Trade Kings from Zambia. There's a survey from our continent uh, that we are seeing. But folks, out of the limits, of the, out of the hearts of history, shame arise up from a past that's rooted in pain arise. I'm a black ocean leaping wide, welling and swelling. I bear the tide, leaving behind nights of terror and fear arise. Into a daybreak that's wondrously clear I rise, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. That is us Africans. We are rising. And here is how we are going to keep on rising and building great brands. I want to share with you the secret of how to build a great brand uh, that lasts uh, uh, beyond us. Because, you know, as us Africans, sometimes we build a brand and when we die, the brand also dies. But folks, we don't remember the guy called Louis Vuitton, do we? He's been dead for a while. But the brand keeps getting better and more expensive. This is how you build a brand. First, we need to move from just supplying raw materials, move up production, adding value, and get to, brand, to branding. So we need to move up the chain. Because most of the time when people come here, they say, where can I find good leather here? Yeah, they come to our countries, they come to Ethiopia, they go to Kenya, they come to Nigeria, and they take the leather and send it back. And they bring it back as expensive products. And we're excited about that and we're willing to pay that. So we need to move up the value chain as well. We need to move up the value chain because that's how we are going to build great brands. People always ask me, so what is a brand? I say, I'm not gonna get academic about it. A brand is a person's gut feeling about a product, a service, a company, about the country. It says, it is not what you say it is, it's what they say it is. A brand, folks, is not a logo. So I know a lot of us love logos and make it bigger, make it smaller, make it darker, make it red, make it... The logo is just an entry point into a brand. Here are the 10 things that distinguish great brands. The first thing to remember about great brands is that they are focused. Focus means when you say Google, 
you know exactly what comes to mind, right? You know, oh, it's a search engine. When you say FedEx, you know, oh, overnight. When you say Walmart, oh, it's cheap. So great brands are very, very focused. The second thing about great brands is that they are distinctive. When I put up this sign, you know exactly what brand is that. Do you see what, do you see, is there a logo there? You know exactly. So part of the secret when you're building a great brand is to make sure that you are creating distinctiveness into your brand. That people can recognize it from anywhere. Do you know, they say when they're making the bottle of Coca-Cola, if you drop the bottle of Coke from the dizzy height and somebody picks up a piece of glass and say, oh, that's Coke. Or should I maybe make an example about Heineken? Oh, it's Sunday. We're not going to do Heineken example, right? But you can tell just from a piece of the bottle what brand it is. So when we're building our brands, because you know a lot of us, the way we build brands is if somebody next door makes something and they make money, we all say, oh, I'm also going to make the same thing. So you imagine what I've been doing as I've been walking around here today. I was trying to look at all these leather-made products, and I saw a sandal that looks like Hermes. I was asking my friend Jonathan, does he think Hermes knows the sandal is here in Africa? Because Hermes is making money out of it, we are out there copying Hermes' sandal and selling it here. So what if they copy our things? We have no excuse. So it starts by us not copying their things and they not copying ours. So great brands also create an emotional connection. And folks, you know, you know, you know how brands are, you know, I don't know, you know, some people go out of their way to go buy a, <laughs> yesterday, I went to Ajankula yesterday, Ajankunde yesterday, and <laughs> Femi was asking me, hey, you arrive in Lagos, the first thing you do, you go to Ajankunde, explain yourself. I said, oh, I wanted to go to the real uh, Lagos, I didn't want to mess around here with uh, buildings, but as we're driving back, oh, my, my, my friend, um, uh, Akin says to me, Tebe, I need to show you, I need to take you to the capital of fakes. I'm like, hey, why do you want to take me to the capital of fakes? He says, you will find Louis Vuitton, you will find Hermes, everything you want. I say, I'm not interested. But you know what, in, what, what I understood? What I understood is that if you can't afford any of those brands, you will buy that because you feel something, right? When you're carrying a bag, when you're carrying your fake Louis Vuitton bag, what do people say? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> you, <laughs> well, you got the real one, right? Because you know how it goes, you buy the key ring for $100, real one at the Louis Vuitton shop, and the rest of the luggage must be fake. But you show them the box for the first one. <laughs> Just I'm kidding. They say if, uh, when you're creating a brand, you must create an emotional connection. People should feel good about the brand. And that's what emotional connection is. So I, I, I used to live in Milwaukee in the US before. I work for Colgate in New York. And, um, and the one interesting thing there is, I went to Harley Davidson. I could never understand this Harley Davidson. You've seen them Harley Davidson, right? They're very ugly, big uh, motorcycles. The people who drive them have got tattoos. I think they're smelling the people who drive them. I don't know, they just don't look clean. Huh? But those people, nine out of 10 times, are richer than you and I will be the rest of our lives. So when they ask the people at, at Harley Davidson, what is so amazing about, uh, about Harley Davidson? They say, what we sell is the ability of a 43-year-old accountant to dress through. What we sell is ability, <laughs> go back. <laughs> what we sell is the ability of a 43-year-old accountant to dress in black leather, ride through small town, and have people very afraid. They say, we sell a feeling. We don't sell the product. So when you're creating a brand, you must remember what, you what you're selling. You want, you know, when, when Femi was making those bags, she wants when people are carrying those bags. You know, I was watching those ladies in the, in the, in the center as they were walking with those bags. They were carrying them like on their hands like this, and they were putting them here, and they were holding them. I'm like, whoa. So it's a feeling. You see, they walk differently. When they're walking without the bag, they're just like this. <laughs> but when they got the bag, it was like, I was like, whoa, the bag does something to them. It's a feeling. You sell emotional connection. That's what you do. The great thing about great bands is that they evolve over time. Yeah. How many people, uh, do you remember the television sets? Do you see how they've changed in time? Okay, the only, I mean, it's been, I think it's been the reversal of fortune, right? Because uh, go back. 
because when the TV, when the when 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 the TVs uh, when the TV started in 1990, or oh, those TVs started, remember they used to have big bugs. And then when we gained our freedom and we made money, we became, and the TVs went. <laughs> Do you remember, right? You know, you see, you see the reversal of fortune here. That's how it goes, um, folks. Do you remember? You know. I think we're gonna fire our technical director. But do you, rem do you remember? Do you remember how uh, how we you know we can? Do you know I always say people we don't understand these things. You know we don't understand how to wear baby very well. But you know you give Nikki uh, you know Nikki the Nikki Art Gallery. You ask her to wear it. Do you remember how she wears it? But if you give her baby, I think she'll struggle. Cause, you know it's not our thing. But our thing. Look at our thing. We know how to wear our thing well. So we must stick to our thing. Good brands uh, do good. Uh, you know, say 70% of the millennials, they say if a brand does not do good for its community, they will punish it. So just because your brand is beautiful, it's amazing, it's well produced, you must also do good for society. Great brands, you must invest in great brands. So when you look at this, um, I don't have the latest one, but when you look at the research that Africans, Africans, we invest less than half percent in research every day. So we are not investing in research. We are busy out there copying other people instead of creating, well, investing in research and finding ways to get, to get, uh, to get better. Great brands are rooted. They've got roots. You know where they come from. I'm going to kill our technical director today. Um, do you know, if you, if, you, uh, if you look at what Oswald has done, Oswald says, Oswald says African luxury is, should be re redefined with every stitch. It must be the embodiment of the continent's history, culture, and style. The celebration of heroes, kings, and queens. Because that's how we see ourselves. We are royalty. Do you know, and that's how Oswald... I mean, I was so impressed when I... Because, you know, when I first met Oswald, I met Oswald about... Seven years ago, Oswald is obviously Ghanaian, a British Ghanaian, and uh, he never used to make those things, always to make beautiful, slick suits. Go look at him now. He realizes that the excellence lies in how we look. He's brought it back in, into his new range. You look at Makosa from South Africa. Uh, he said, you know, our, our culture is the men go to the mountain, they come back with 10% uh, less of something. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Um, you know, uh, and it's just part of our culture, how we do things. And, but when they come back, they put them in a beautiful, colorful jersey and all those. He's like, but it's our culture. Why should we not celebrate that culture and put it on the ramp? Yesterday, he, yesterday or two days ago, no, two days ago, he was at a New York, fest, uh, fest, um, New York fashion show, showcasing African excellence or excellence from Africa. Not African excellence, excellence from Africa. Because you know, I always worry when you say African excellence, it sounds like it's a different excellence. It's just excellence from Africa. Headed on the ramp and yesterday got standing ovations. And he was overwhelmed, you know. I spoke to him on the phone. I said, how did it go? He says, they loved me. They loved us. I said, you know why they loved you, Aladuma? They loved you because you brought you authentically to the stage. You did not try to become them. You know, if you look at, um, you go to look at our, our brothers, the Yorubas, how they, and how they, uh, they, uh, they weave, they weave uh, um, uh, uh, the Asoke and all that. And then you look at what a young man, uh, uh, Tunde, Tunde somewhere here. Tunde, where are you? Yeah, there we go. You know, everybody saw Tunde, right? How Tunde said, Tunde said, it's our culture. It needs to be celebrated in our products. And that's what we need to do. You go to Femi, Femi. Do you guys, when, do you guys get, do you place your orders for your bags by Femi? Hey, you must place your order. Otherwise, you're not invited next year. Uh, please, everybody, uh, place your orders. But you know, because the products have got a part of who we are all the time. And that's what makes us different. You go to Laula and But you know, Laula was saying that until Beyonce called him, Nobody looked at him. Because that's how we are as Africans. We want other people to tell us we're excellent before we 
recognize how amazing we are. Laul was a lawyer. He left here. He went to New York and he started showing his culture. And they're like, wow, we love it. You see him now. Everybody's calling him from Nike to everybody. Great bands are valued. And value is really about understanding that the important thing about your brand, which you must understand, is that thing called intellectual property. Do you know when the people at um, the people at um, Ethiopian Coffee, when they wanted to, when they didn't understand that they used to buy the people from Starbucks used to come from America, buy buy coffee from Ethiopia for two dollars and sell it for twenty four or make twenty four out of it. They are like, eh, hey, hey, these people are doing witchcraft. How do they make twenty four dollars out of two dollars of our bag? It's not called witchcraft. When they went to speak to the people at, at uh, Starbucks, they said to me, said to them, how do you do it? They call branding. They say it's our brand. People love Starbucks coffee, but they're like, no, but it's the coffee from us. They say, no, no, no. We just get the beans from you and we sell them the brand. So guess what happened? The people at Starbucks, they decided we need to brand our coffee. So they branded into Hara, Yigav Chefe, and Sidamo. And when the people at, uh, at Starbucks came, came back to buy coffee, they sold the coffee back to them for $24. And the people at Starbucks said, uh, uh, hold, hold, hold up, hold up, hold up. How did we go from 2 to 24 They're like, branding. <laughs> we learned from you. <laughs> no. And they fought over the next three years. If you remember the case study, they fought for three years about the intellectual property, about who owns what, because, because Starbucks was also naming the brands uh, according to Ethiopian names. They fought, they agreed, and they met each other halfway. They're not making 24, they're making some, and uh, Starbucks is not making 24 anyway. They met each other halfway. You must protect your brand. Protect your brand. Do not copy other people's brands. Invest in research. Try and understand how to make your brand different compared to others. Great brands collaborate. Do you know what you must appreciate is, you know, for a long time, only 12% Africans collaborate with each other, only 12%. So they move one goods from here to here, only 12%. If you go to Europe, 70% they sell to each other. So more than half of the goods they make in Europe, they sell to Europeans. Africans, no, 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 no. Mm -mm. We want to take our money from Lagos to London. We don't want to take our money from La La Lagos and take it to, we don't take our money from Lagos and take it maybe to another country, a city in, our, in, in Africa. So our job to get better we need to trade with each other. We need to trade with each other. You need to buy the leather from somebody in uh, Nigeria, sell it to somebody in Kenya uh, uh, who makes products that they sell to somebody in South Africa. Keep the money here at home. Folks, the Chinese have taught us the lesson. You go to China, uh, you cannot in China use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and all those. They've got their own. They're like, this is China. We have our own things, and they make more money than that's why Donald Trump is upset because the Chinese are making money for themselves, and that's why you must be proud that we are now getting our own currency in West Africa. It's going to be East Africa very soon, and we'll be able to make ourselves. That's why you must be proud of the people in East Africa who are saying that we're in Africa. We are going to speak Kiswahili in East Africa because it's the biggest African language. So, because, you know, if you understand each other, speak the same language, trade is much easier with each other. And that's what we need to do. We need to collaborate with each other. Finally, great brands own the value chain. You know, if you look at a brand like uh, The Beers, The Beers, obviously, a diamond is forever. What the brand like The Beers have done is they've said, if you're going to explore it here in Africa, mine it here in Africa, Wash it here in Africa, cut it in Africa, brand it in Africa, sell it to the world. You know, because what used to happen a long time, they used to take the diamonds out of South Africa and Botswana, take them to London to polish them. I'm like, hey, what's wrong with our polish? You know, cut them in London, send them back to us 
very expensively. The people in Botswana, they said, no more. Everything is now to be done in Botswana. We want the whole value chain here. So we should do the same, folks. We take our resources and make sure our, our resources are doing. And here is how we are doing now as Africans. Just last couple of slides on how we're doing. This is how we're doing. We are now seeing, after calling us monkeys, H&M had to apologize. We said, H&M, we don't accept any other apology but space on your, on, on your rails. So what happened? They collaborated with Manchu and launched the first African to launch together in over 40 shops across the world. So now anywhere you go into the world, you get to see this beautiful African elegance from our continent around the world. That's the only apology we take if it's, um, if it's good in our pocket and our bank accounts. Munch is going to do very well. Thank you very much. Uh, if you look at young Tebe and um, I think Kenneth Ize as well from here. Kenneth Ize and Tebe were in the final, um, final, eight, uh, final six uh, for the Louis Vuitton prize. Um, young Tebe won it. Um, it was, I mean, $300,000. I was speaking to Tebe. Tebe grew up in my grew up about, um, his, his I went to school with his father, so you know these fathers, they give people, children, they're my name, and they need to start paying. Um, and um, and Tebo was saying to me, everybody's calling me, he says, I'm discovering family I did not know. I'm like, hey, this is Africa, black tax. They will, an uncle will come from the woodwork you did not know you have. Even your mother will come back from the grave. I said, everybody wants a piece of that 300,000 euro. How do you expect us to live? You want to win and eat it by yourself. I say, it's all ours, Tebe. It's our money we are spending. So we are celebrating something. So Louis Vuitton, instead of just selling back to us those expensive uh, blankets which they stole from us, they are now saying, we'll take one of your own, we will mold him, we'll shape him, we'll teach him how to do it, and he must go back. You know, I said to Tebe, what was the conditions? Why did you win? He says, the reason I won, I said to them, I'm not moving to Paris. I'm going to fly in and out of Paris because I want to be based in Johannesburg, in Africa. He says, because I want to be able to create excellence here where the source comes from. Because you know, a lot of us, you know, when we become famous, we now want to move to Europe. They don't look like you. They don't like you. They don't think much about you. You are better here. You know what we call, you know, like when you walk around the streets in Oxford or in Fifth Avenue, you see another black man, you're like, hey, you're here too. <laughs> <laughs> like the struggle is real because we're all in Europe, right? You know, I don't understand what Tebe was doing there, but I mean, that's Tebe's uh, uh, dresses on trees. But I mean, we've got enough clothing designers here who can understand what those trees are doing. Uh, but, um, but those trees are good enough to get him into Paris. You know, you look at her, I called, you know, I called Swadi. Swadi is a very good friend of mine. She's uh, from Côte d'Ivoire. I said, Swadi, I just left um, Selfridges in London. And she says, so? Everybody leaves Swadi Selfridges. I said, no, Swadi, your tea was on the shelves in Selfridges. She's like, Tebe, we've arrived. Because our tea should be good enough to be on the shelves. And do you know why it's so good enough? Swadi packages exquisitely. You know, and of course, yesterday, um, yesterday I decided, let me go have coffee uh, for free because I can't afford anything at uh, Alara. So I went to Alara um, and they were giving me Iswara tea for free. And you know, I was like, whoa, okay, I bought one or two things I can't afford, but I'll deal with the bank manager later. Uh, you know, I was like, and what I like about what Rennie said, Rennie, I mean, this beauty, the beauty about this store is that it's owned by a Nigerian who hired a Ghanaian to design it and has created a platform for Africans and other global brands to showcase their work. Folks, it's okay. I think, okay, I hope she can do more African than more international, but it's a process. The shop is exquisite. Uh, it is done in a way that you're like, hmm, I want them to, because you know, ladies, uh, what did you do with that, uh, the used bag from Louis Vuitton that you had? Do you still keep it? <laughs> you threw it away. Because you know what we do, right? 
We go to Louis Vuitton and buy, and, and buy something for two dollars and they give us a big bag. And that bag, we recycle it every time. Every time we go to shop, right, we take the bag. And people say, but hey, I haven't seen a Louis Vuitton shop here in Lagos. But you must see my sisters with the bag on the high streets of Lagos. Folks, the reason we're going to succeed, we're going to succeed because as Fela Kuti says, you must identify with Africa, then you'll have an identity. Thank you. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, Tebe. That was wonderful. And he's such a great storyteller as well. Yes, yeah, sit down. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. All right, we're going to invite uh, the other two speakers who will be uh, joining us for this conversation. And we've got Shem Ezemma, who is a footwear and product designer and the creative director of the avant-garde footwear brand, Shem Paranelli. He's a seasoned and experienced creative director and design artist with a strong aesthetic sensibility, a unique vision, and an exquisite skill at excellence execution and presentation. Proven to be... Uh, adept in the vast fields of product design and development, Shem has, a dem has, demonstrated, has a demonstrated history of proficiency in the fields of luxury, brand building, niche, fashion and lifestyle, as well as interiors and furniture with nine years of industry experience. Please welcome Shem Ezema, who will be joining us for this next conversation as well. You're welcome. Thank you very much. All right. We also have joining us for this conversation... The Femi Olayebi, who is a self-taught, award-winning handbag designer, trainer, mentor, and the creative brain behind the eponymous Femi Handbags brand. In 2008, she became a Goldman Sachs 10,000 women scholar and was twice nominated to attend programs in the United States where she job shadowed some of the world's most famous handbag designers. And in 2010, she participated in her first international handbag show, PR London, and in 2012, her business became a case study for MBA students at the Lagos Business School. In 2017, she championed the Lagos Leather Fair, which provided a platform for leather designers and other stakeholders along the leather value chain. In 2018, she showed her signature pieces at the autumn winter edition of the London Fashion Week and was later showcased on CNN Marketplace Africa. Her easily recognizable bags are stocked in Lagos, Paris and New York. Please put your hands together for Femi or Laebi. In fact, she really does deserve a standing ovation for putting this amazing, amazing event together. Really, really deserving of a, of a standing ovation. Thank you so much. And it is so good to have you here. So storytelling. Tebe is obviously a really great storyteller. And you've said so much, such a powerful uh, presentation uh, over here and how Africans need to start to tell our own stories. So, I mean, for young people here who are starting out, I can imagine maybe like a Nike having a story that can endear you to people who feel like, oh, you know, can experience big brands. But for young people who are just starting out, how do you even start to tell, you know, your story in a way that your, your uh, customers connect with you? Well, I think the, the first thing is to connect with the real you. Uh, a lot of us, a lot, a, a lot of us, you know, do not believe in us and don't even know us. So if you don't believe in yourself, you won't be able to be authentic in telling a story. Because I always say the one first thing or the one person you know best is yourself. You know, your culture, your language, your way of life. That's how you should translate it into, into building a, a great brand, rather than try to copy other people. Because when you copy other people, you aren't able to tell the story well, because you don't know where the story comes from. But remember, your story comes from the moment you are born and breastfed, and they teach you how to speak, they teach you the idioms, they teach you how to recite stories, they tell you the stories about your, your family, where you come from. That's what comes through authentically. Great brands are authentic. How were you? Um, how, how how did you start out, and then get people to, you know, just see a Femi handbag and just think, ah? Oh. I don't think I want to tell that story about how I started out. <laughs> so I'll delve long right one. into the. It's the long one. Okay, I started out because um, I accidentally made a baby bag for my first daughter, and um, so it wasn't like I planned to be a businesswoman, but it just happened. So really, what's happening today happened to me. Um, in terms of building that, what I just did was I stayed consistent. And I, he's used several words today. And he's hammered on the word authentic. When I started out, I know now that I must have color in my DNA. 
because I just make, I just love color. I love colorful things. So I always made colorful things. And I remember when I started out, people would come to me and say, why didn't you just, you know, tone it down? Why didn't you make black? People are more, would be more um, prone to carry a black bag or a brown bag. And I always said to myself, I'm not gonna make a brown bag. I'm not gonna make a black bag. And I'm not gonna make a blue bag. You know, there's, there are enough black bags in the world. So I just want to add some color. And I've never really been able to understand why during the winter times, we, at, abroad in Europe, you are consigned to carrying black bags. The weather is gloomy enough. Please add some color, carry a red bag, a yellow bag. You know, so basically, I just built that consistently. And um, it, my brand has suddenly, well, not suddenly, gradually become known for what it is. So if you go to my Instagram page, for example, the words that I've used there to describe the brand are exuberant, fun, colorful, you know, full of life. And that's really what we need to do with our brands. We need, our brands need to reflect who we are. You know, it's, it's about having a brand personality. What is the personality of your brand? How do you want your brand to be perceived by others? He's also talked about perception. It's not necessarily about what you think. It's about how do other people see your brand. And that's something that we need to, um, we need to look at, uh, delve into properly. Because a lot of, uh, a lot of people are copying, he's, he's mentioned Hermes, there are quite a few brands out there that have created the H slipper. But you don't have to, you can get inspired by an Hermes. So we are all looking for inspiration. You know, I, 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 there's a particular strap that I make, for example, and I know that I got the inspiration from Dolce & Gabbana. But Dolce & Gabbana cannot come out to me today and say, you copied my strap, because I took the idea and I made it my own. So that's what we all need to try and do with this. You know, we need to be distinctive. We need to create products that when you look at them, you can tell this is a Femi handbag. Mm -hmm or this is a Nicole by Haguana. You know, we need, we, we need to slow down and do research. We don't, I, I take these classes in Ibadan, uh, and one of the first things I tell them for the very first day, I say to them, my trainees, this is a thinking day. Let us stop, and that's one of my trainees in front there. Let us stop to think. Let us stop to create mood boards. You know, how are you feeling? What do you want? Uh, who, who's your target customer? Who is going to buy this product? Is it high level? Is it mid level? Is it lower level? So we need to determine who's your customer? Who are you making the bags for? I make colorful bags and I always say, you either hate my bag or you love my bag. I'm not trying to impress anybody. I'm just being exactly who I am. And I think that's the key, being who you are. And you will always stand out that way. Wow, fantastic. Chef Bebe says 83% did you say of Africans or Nigerians don't like Nigerian made Africa. products? Africans don't like how are you able to mount that and how can we change that narrative? All right, thank you so much. Um, I feel um, the, the core of the, of the discourse is actually, like I said, um, understanding who you are. You know, um, I have a background in psychology and consumer behavior. So, um, that also helped me uh, when I set out to, you know, um, build my brand. And what I, I was able to understand from, you know, psychology is that if you are able to introspect, to understand yourself better, then you can relate with the world better. Now, the relationship you have with the world could be, you know, by where of the service you offer, by the product that you put out there. Um, and you need to understand that there there is someone who actually, you know, we use the word vibe these days. There's someone somewhere who vibes with you. You know, you are not sent to everybody, but you are sent to certain people. So if you are um, um, convinced enough to believe in what you represent, then you should be able to also realize that there's someone out there, you know, who can connect with whatever you're doing. It's, it's very interesting because, you know, it's almost like a sharp contrast between I and Auntie Femi, um, she's a bar color, I'm more about like the subdued colors and the earth colors and the likes, but I do a lot of distressed, you know, pieces, you know, um, but they, you know, it's so amazing that, you know, there are actually Nigerians who connect with the things that I make, 
you know, the things that we produce and the things that we put there, you know, and it's, it's about being authentic. It's about introspection. It's about understanding who you are and then being confident, you know, in communicating that effectively. And, you know, um, all Africans are not into color. There are some other Africans, uh, come on, I'm African, but I love black, I love earth colors. You know, there are also some other Africans who, so w there's a market for everybody. There's a market for everybody. There's something that you have to offer that someone can relate to around you. You just need to find a way to communicate it in such a convincing and authentic manner. Hey, all right, yeah. so you know how this is going to go. We're sending the mic out to you. Uh, join the conversation. This is what it really is, a conversation. So let's see who wants to wait in real quickly and ask her. Okay, we've got someone here. Can you bring the mic up front real quickly? Okay, please tell us your name and then go straight to your question. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> good evening, everyone. My name is Titilola Belu, and um, my question is, what role does your whole bring in what role does it have to play in the brand you put out to the world? Let's say you were raised in a family that maybe low class or you were born with a wooden spoon, not even a spoon at all. Do you understand? So your perception of that luxury thing might be a little bit hard for you to conceive. Do you understand? So does it play any role at all in the kind of brand you should put out out there? Like your personal branding. Okay, okay, quite interesting. I, I would like to take that question. And um, because why, why that question stands out to me is because of what you said about luxury. Now, um, all designers, there's no rule that says that every designer must be a luxury designer. You know, and that's actually a myth that we need to squash, Hello. especially in Africa. I feel everybody wants to, you know, um, appeal to some, I don't know, some, I don't know how they come up with these ideas. But you see, um, I was just talking to one of the designers out there and I told him, I said, what I feel is that the first thing you need to do in starting out, I, I'm talking about someone who wants to start out right now, and you, in starting out is to be sure what you want to say and who you are talking to. You have to be very, you have to be clear on that. You know, you have to have the end in mind. Where is this thing you're building going? You know, are you going, are you, are you walking towards building a luxury brand? If that is who you are, if that's what you feel, you know, confident enough to do, or are you looking at like building something? Because I asked, I asked the gentleman, I asked him, I said, what's the price point of your shoes? And he told me, I said, well, it depends on what you want to do. I asked him, I said, how many pairs of shoes do you make in a, in a, in a month? And he gave me a figure. And I said, you have to be sure that, you know, there's a consistency between all of these things. And it starts with you. What's the vision that you have for the future, for the business that you're building, for the brand that you're building? You have to be clear. Do you want to do a high street? Do you want to do something at a price point of Primark or Hater Name or, you know, you have to be definite, you have to know. So the inspiration that you draw from your upbringing is very, very important. I feel like what makes a brand special is the soul. And you know, in psychology we thought that the soul is like the seat of the intellect, the will, and um, your, your, your emotions, right? So you need to understand how to pool all of these resources that you have. You know, that's why I mentioned introspection. You have to spend time to understand yourself, understand the market, see the need in the market, and then you ask yourself, how am I going to be able to articulate all of these things, my personality, my upbringing, my belief systems? I love architecture so much. I love um, specifically brutalist architecture. I love anything that has to do with avant-garde elements. I love, you know, poetry. And those are the things that come, I bring in, you know, handy. I grew up in a very spiritual environment. So there's also an element of spirituality in whatever I'm creating. So it's, it's you know, your brand is a summation of who you are. You know, the combination of everything, your experiences, what you like, what you don't like, you know, all of those. So you, you're, you're just like Lupita will say, your dreams are valid. Your experiences are valid. You, doesn't have to, you don't have to mirror another person. Be you and then choose what you want to say and then you know, get to know who you're speaking to and then you know, go ahead and... You know. No, I was just going to say, uh, and I agree with you, and I was also going to say, where you come from has got nothing to do with where you're going to end up in life. Uh, because it all just starts with, with your ambitions in life. You know, I was speaking to the, uh, the old lady, she's 83, uh, Esther Matlangu. Uh, she does those in Debele, uh, 
patterns. And uh, she's a rural woman. She does not speak English, and she doesn't need to speak English. And she has no interest in speaking English. But her work is uh, in Paris, yeah. in London. She's the only African who's been asked by BMW. So No, she's the only artist, not African. Only artist in the world asked by BMW twice to decorate their car uh, with those uh, geometric uh, 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 colors. And you know, I said to her, I said to Mama, where do you, so what inspires you? Where do you get all this to be all this? She says, she says, my son, I'm a rural woman. I do nothing special. I just do that which I grew up with, yeah. which is decorate your home, make it look beautiful. And that is what people are buying. They are buying me. Yeah. says, because my creativity comes from who I am, yeah. from where yeah. I come from. So I know a lot of us like to make excuses that I grew up poor or other people I grew up rich. Yeah. I know a young man in Rwanda, Cedric, he, he just won the British Fashion Council something, something. He is from a rural area in Rwanda. And I said to him, your work is now in the British something's Museum of Fashion. It's going to Netherlands. How did you do that, Cedric? He said to me, I was inspired by where I come from, the rural people that I grew up with and how they live. I took that to the world, and that's what succeeds. So it comes from who you are. Don't worry about what's happening around you. What's happening around you is none of your business. The only business you've got is who you are. Mm, fabulous. Okay, I think the mic. Do you, oh, do you have a mic? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with that. That um, it, it, it's, it's, it comes from your soul. It's important to, to not limit yourself or your creativity or that which can com come from within you by making excuses, like he said. Mm -hmm. And that's something I say all the time. Okay, so I don't have, um, I, I don't have enough money, that's, that, that's the reason. Or this other person has succeeded because they had more money than me. You know, I, don't, I honestly don't think, yes, it might help, but I don't think that that has much to do with anything. I think it all really depends on us, you know. Um, and I'll use this, this event as, as um, an example. You know, I'm a very spontaneous person, and I just come up with ideas. And the moment I throw that idea out there, I'm like, you know what, I'm not going to let anything stop me, you know? So I just walk into it. Once I believe in what I am doing, I run with it, and guess what? It does end up being a success, because it's authentically you. You've done something that you truly, truly believe in, that has welled up from within yourself. So I think, and again, it goes back to just being able to understand your environment, understand the people around you, understanding your culture, and knowing that you have some kind of gap to fill. That is also very important, that you're feeling a need somewhere and nothing around you. So, so don't, don't, don't let your environment, your background, or anything else limit what you can be. And he has said it. It doesn't matter whether you grew up from wherever, Anything is possible. Yeah. You can think it. Once you can think it, truly, you can do it. Yeah. Just throw it out there in the universe, and it's done. Fantastic. All right, so let's keep the mic going. Who would like to ask a question? OK, we've got someone over there. Hello. Oh, hi. Hi. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rita Ohai. I'm, uh, I'm a businesswoman. I'm actually the founder of a market research company. I'm not a leather maker. I just bought a beautiful leather purse from Obi Leather, and I think it's you know wonderful. And I'm asking this question on behalf of young lady. Why do you keep pulling me back? <laughs> okay. All right. So I'm just asking this question on behalf of people who are looking to build a brand, particularly to Febe and to Femi, because I know that you've walked this path, yeah. So how does a budding budding entrepreneur, a budding leather maker? position their brand effectively so that it's speaking to the people who are going to buy the product, number one, and how do they communicate it so that people can make a purchase? Those are my two questions. Okay, thank you. You know, I read some, some day somewhere about um, why people buy anything. And the best answer I got was people buy good feelings about themselves. <laughs> That's why they buy. So when they come to the shop and they buy a bag a dress and all those, 
they are buying compliments, they are buying feelings, they are buying how they want to be responded to or how they feel. So when, when you're beginning to, uh, the, the, foundations of, uh, the foundations of a great brand are first the insights. Understand, do your research, understand who you want to target. And the second thing you must understand is how you want them to feel about your product, your service, your whatever it is that you're going to sell. So in other words, that which you sell, what feeling must it conjure up in them? But most importantly, how different is your product from what everybody else is doing? Because remember, it's very, very competitive out there. So you must, positioning is all about how you fit in, how you stand out from the rest of the competition. If you start with that way, then you're in, in, a, in a great position. Because a lot of times what most of us do is we just start by making. We don't start by thinking. So you need to think, you need to feel, you need to mold, you need to create, then you need to take out. But the most important lesson about branding, building a brand, is that you build a brand the way a, a bird builds a nest, one strand at a time. You need to be very patient. A lot of us, you know, we look at, we're like, hey, famous God bags out. I need to get mine out by the next weekend as well. Well, it doesn't take that short. You must take time. You must build your craft, build your idea, and relate it and test it out into the world. Be patient. The most important thing about building a brand, it's patient. All the brands that you love, how old are they? Coca-Cola, 1886. The Louis Vuitton, 1800s. The, all the brands that you love today about the world ones, they've been around for a long time. 50, 100 years. So it's better to build for the long distance than to build for the short distance. Building a brand is not a sprint, it's a marathon. Mm, fantastic. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> yes, um, I'd like to start by saying good things take time. And it's important to realize that Femi, yes, has been doing this for, when people here have been doing this for 27 years, they gasp and they're like, ah, oh, I'm not going to spend 27 years trying to build the brand. But you know what? I'm fine. Because I have taken my time to build a strong brand. And I think that it's important to ask ourselves, to be introspective, as he has said. We need to ask ourselves those extremely essential questions. Who do I want to sell to? Who is my target market? First of all, you must realize that you cannot sell to everybody. So you need to determine, who am I selling to? I remember when I'm, I've been my own brand builder for years, and I've tried to understand the true meaning, the true essence of a brand. And I think that the very first time I had a good understanding was I was in business school for the first time, and um, someone had come to give us a lecture, and he was talking about branding. And I showed him my, um, my little brochure, and I asked him, who am I? And in front of that brochure, I had um, very colorful stuff as usual, colors. And he said, oh yeah, you're very colorful, you're exuberant, you're lively, you know, you're, you're a pop of, pop of color. And I said, fine. Then he opened the little brochure and inside it, then he, he looked at me strangely and he thought, I don't know who you are anymore. Because inside it, I had bags, I had laundry hampers for kids, I had toy mats for kids. I had a furniture because I was also doing interiors. I was so many things. And he said, I don't recognize you anymore. And I didn't understand. And then he started to explain to me that this is not how a brand works. Who exactly are you? What is your brand personality? When people look at your product, how do you want them to feel? How do you want them to perceive you? Um, and then decided, OK. So I went back to the drawing table and did a lot of research on branding and started to understand that I cannot put a little label of cloth on a, 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 a rucksack for a child as I would on a handbag for uh, an HNI. And I started trying to distinguish my, the different products within my organization. I started to create sub-brands. And that's how Femi Handbags was actually born, because I realized that I wanted to position that particular brand a certain way, and in positioning it, it's a total package. So it's about the way you package your product. 
it's about the way you label your product. It's about the way you, you, you pack it, you label, you, you brand it. It's, and as he has said, it's not just about the logo. It's so many things rolled into one. It's about service. It's about the way you go and deliver. Do you want to deliver that brand in a Rolls Royce? Or do you just want to send an Uber? It's so many things rolled into one. And I think that those are the things that we need to consider. We need to look at when building the brand. We need to take our time to understand, to have a full understanding of who we are selling to. For me, I think that's the number one, that's the number one task for everybody today. Who do you want to sell your product to? And then when you determine that, how do I sell that product? How do I package that product? It's an emotional thing. And I mean, they've said so much today. I, I have a shop at, um, in, somewhere in Ikoi, and the fact of even having the shop in Ikoi is also part of the strategy of building this brand, positioning it. So I decided I didn't want to be in a mall. I wanted to be a standalone. Because that, what is your USP? How do you want people, what, how do you stand apart from the crowd? There's so many handbag makers. How do you want to be different? What makes you different? When you walk into my store, the smell, the way it looks, the colors. So it's about the look, the feel, the touch. You know, people want to touch. People, it's, an, it's a total experience. And I think that we need to start slowing down and working on those things. It's very important. Fantastic. All right, let's keep the mics going to our next question. Okay. Okay, my name is Godwin now, did it? Um, Godwin Deep, for coming from Godwin Deep. Okay, I want to ask something. Like, can you see this pause? And I made this pause, and right now I'm having issue with my mom. She said, is that I forget about this logo, or I should forget about that I should pick one? Well, we can't really see the logo. Like, she said, this is the money called. I don't oh. even know. How do I do about that? Like the logo, his mom thinks the logo is demonic, so his mom says, "Choose the logo or forget about me." She doesn't want him associated with anything that looks demonic. So what is? Oh, okay. Yes, yes. I mean the calories. Yes. She said she don't like. She doesn't like. Like the... she ate the calories. So what's the question? So what's your question? Okay, I'm asking that. What should I do with that now? Should I leave the house because of the calories? Should we leave? I think she's not interested. I don't think she's interested. I don't want to take the answer. You don't say the question. I don't So his mom thinks the calorie is sort of uh, synonymous with demonic yes. herbalist sort of yes. thing. So should he stick with his, I mean, say this is what he wants or should he... What, what, um, Alexander McQueen. Yeah. You know Alexander McQueen, right? He's got the skull as his, as his identity. Now, when we are all growing up, we thought skull, oh, you can't put a skull. A skull is uh, bad luck. He decided that's the symbol that he uses and he's stuck to it. So you see, when you're building a great brand, you don't ask for permission. You, ex you, you present your brand. So your mom is not you. You Absolutely. know what you want to do. So I think you must, you must go ahead with how you feel. And we, and remember what a brand is. It's not what you say, it's what we say it is. So we'll tell you when you go on the market what we feel. Don't worry about your mom. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's take that question. There's someone's, there's a hand up there. Where's the mic? Okay. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Yene. I just want to contribute to what he has said. And um, one of the things I told my fiance here that if that logo brings $5 million to yeah. the mom, she will approve it regardless. So it's not really the logo. I think it's your job to enlighten your mom. Like sit her down because I remember starting something, Photo Waka Africa. And my mom was like, what's all this Waka 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 about? And we did a Guinness World Record last month. I wish she was in Lagos, she would have been there. She told me, you know, I wish I was there for your Guinness World Record event. But prior to that time, last year, she was telling me, what is this, Waka Waka? I think just be focused on your brand and be patient with your mom. 
understand she's saying what she knows. People act and say what they know at that time. And you are acting because you are more enlightened. I think it's for you to transfer or communicate what you are seeing or that image you have in your mind to her. And I believe, you know, she's a good mom. She will always agree with her son. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Great. Okay. Let's keep the mic. There's someone over here. Sorry. Actually, um, hello. Hi. My name is Hazel. So I just wanted to add to what he said. I think, you know, with everything we've said, we've been giving ourselves like a lot of good ideas, encouragement and all. I think in Nigeria, we have a particular challenge with parents and you know, their approvals and all. I do interior design, so this is to you, because I saw your um, purse. I actually like it, it's very nice, if that encourages you. I do interior design, but I also remember when I wanted to do interior design, my parents were like, ah, uh, you know, they were, they were not too forthcoming with, with it, with the idea. And so I had to bargain with them. I said, okay, look, um, give me a year, because I studied um, information systems and management. So I said, give me a year to do what I want to do. And if it doesn't work out, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And obviously, we came to that agreement. And within that year, um, I think I hammered enough. <laughs> I made enough money and they were like, oh yeah, good, good, good. And they supported me. So yes, we definitely have that challenge when it comes to the African mentality or the Nigerian mentality. And I think it's, like he said, you just need to enlighten your mom about it and, you know, find a way to come to some sort of terms of agreement. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and I think um, you shouldn't be discouraged. You should just do what comes from your heart and what makes you happy. That's just to add to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, can we go back to questions? Let's take the next question. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm Ward Rapaman. My question is to Mrs. Femi. Um, first of all, thanks to the organizers of this event for allowing people like us to come in. I'm not um, a letter maker, nothing. I'm a rompreneur, I'm a charity runner. I just want to know, Ms. Femi, what keeps you going when everything seems not to be working? What really keeps you going? What fuels you? Um, I guess one of the obvious answers to that would be my passion. Uh, I'm very passionate about everything that I do. But I also think that it's something to do with my background, the way I was brought up. I was brought up by a very strict dad, but a dad that, um, or rather, well, strict dad, um, less strict mom, um, but parents who made me do whatever I, I believed I could do. You know, so I, I was not limited by anything. I was very, I grew up very independent. Um, I would just get up and go. So I always had this get up and go spirit. And I think that that is what has just carried me through my years. Um, I also, so I think it's a, it's a character trait. I, I really think that's what it is, because there's many things in this, in this system that can break you. So it's, it's really up to you to decide, you know what, I'm not going to let this break me. Um, and one of the decisions I have made over time, over the last few years, because things keep, seem to get more and more and more difficult. It's unfortunate that in our system, things just don't get easier. In other places, they probably do. But here, you wake up and there's some obstacle or the other just waiting to, you know, fall you down, like we say. Um, so it's, it's that restless spirit. And it's the, it's the determination to say to myself, you know what, I'm going to create beauty, whatever it is. In, within all the mess around me, I'm going to create a world within a world. I'm going to continue to make beautiful bags. I'm going to create this leather fair, and I'm going to do it differently. I'm not going to slap, just slap boots together. I'm going to create a platform, but I'm also going to curate a platform. I'm going to make sure that you walk in and it's going to be different. And you know, so those are the things that excite me. I love what I do very much. Um, and 
I've always decided that, you know what, and that's one of the reasons why I'm here. Um, in spite of those no's that you get, and you do get a lot of no's, but you must also realize that at somewhere around the corner, that big yes will come. So I'm passionate. Hold on to that passion, because if you are not passionate, the struggle will certainly, um, it, the struggle can kill you. Oh, so you. just keep doing what you're doing. And look at people like myself <laughs> and them, and you just know that it is possible mm. in spite of everything. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, there's some... Okay, we've got lots of people here. A few people. Where's the mic? Okay, okay. Let's, okay, here, let's take the gentleman and then we'll come to you. We'll be with you in a moment. We'll come to you in a moment. Hi, good evening. My name is Alafi Agbadibo. I have a brand called Zoku. Zoku, Zoku. Yeah. My, call, my question is to Teme. How do you curb the rate of... I won't call it piracy. The way people copy your brand is crazy. It's, and who do you report to? Af, it's, it's alarming. So it's not even about now. The fear is if you now go grow the brand more than what it is now, and everybody is copying, not just even copying the design, posting your product is it's really crazy. So I want to ask, I don't know where you're from, but in this part of where we are, I don't know how we want to copy it here. So if you have an idea of how we can copy this, I really appreciate okay. it. You, you haven't been to China. They copy everything there. The China's make us look like we were playing jokes. But I think, uh, you know, last year, Marcos Aladuma had, um, uh, had Zara copy his socks. I think I showed them there. You saw the socks. And, uh, uh, and he came to see me, he says to me, uh, Tebe, what do I do now? Because Zara is so big. It's a Spanish brand. They are, I mean, remember the, the owner of Zara is the richest man in the world. And he said, how do I stop? I said, how do I fight against Zara? I'm a small person. My brand is found in a small boutique in France, in uh, America and South Africa. He says, but how do I do that? As, he says, do I just sit down and just sit in my corner and shut up? I'm like, no. And you know how he found out? Because you know, Africans, we like to blame each other. We think we're the worst. He was sitting in Johannesburg. Somebody sends him a picture from London. He says, hey, I just saw your, your sock from, in Zara in London. A sock that looks just like your sock. And send that picture that you saw. It's, uh, that, uh, that's why it's so grainy. And send me the picture. So I, when he came to me, I said, we are going to deal with Zara two ways. The way I dealt with them. The way, with, first I called my, my intellectual property lawyer. So get yourself a good intellectual property lawyer or a trademark lawyer. I always say in branding, when you think it, trademark it. So that's the first thing. When an idea comes to your head, get a lawyer and say, I want to protect my idea. Because in law, it's whoever protects it first or practices it longest that wins. So you protect your idea first. So we, what we did with, with Zara, we did two things. One, we put it out in social media, it was everywhere, that Zara is copying ideas. So I wrote a long piece about it on social media. By the end of the week, it was in all the radio stations. It was in all, so now it was a bad PR for Zara. Zara did not like the PR. So second, we wrote a long letter to them in Spain. And we said to them, you have copied us and we are going to sue you. So don't be afraid about your size. You must remember the story of, what is it, uh, David and Goliath. Uh, that's how it, so, so you must think exactly the same way. That even the smallest end can annoy the biggest elephant. So, you, so you, 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 must, you must assert your rights. Get yourself a lawyer. Get out there. But of course, everything starts with yourself. Also look at yourself. You know, like I said, I was walking around here. And also look at that. If we ourselves copy, then we are giving permission to other people to copy us as well. But whatever happens, fight for your rights. Get yourself a lawyer. It's expensive, but it's actually cheaper to, uh, to protect than to defend. Mm. So protect first and th rather than spend the money trying to defend. Because once you protect it, it's quite easy. It's in lawyer says, you're copying me and you'll pay my legal expenses. Mm -hmm. People will stop. Right. Um, I'd just like to add to that, and I think that's an awesome question. Everybody goes through the, the process of being copied. Um, and in the past month, 
especially, I don't know why, maybe because this event was going to take place, uh, but I've been getting a lot of, Auntie Femi, this person copied me, that person copied me, da 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 It's been all over the place. I have been copied a thousand times. However, that's why it is important to build a strong brand. It's really, really important, you know, so that when you get copied, there's, I've just been told, I don't know what that law is, but I've just been told that um, um, a new, some new law has just come out in the United States which says that the moment you put your product out there, it is as good as copyrighted. So what I want to say to anybody here today is do not be afraid to put your product out there. Because trust me, if you don't, and they get it out there first, oh, mm. there's no way you can defend yourself. You might as well have copied them. So don't be afraid to put, when you have something new, put it out there, brand it, just keep push, pushing it out there. And then, just like he said, um, the advice that I gave somebody last week was, put it on social media, paste the picture of yours, look at the dates which you posted yours, you know, so timelines are also important. Then look at when she posted hers, and then you can say, so you can defend yourself easily and say, you know what, I created this thing, but way back in 2017, and you just took it, and like you said, people actually post your pictures. It is all over the place, and I don't know that there's much that we can do. However, don't think of the money. Don't say to yourself, oh, it's expensive to, um, to uh, protect my brand. You've got to start somewhere. I have started to protect my handbags, and what have I done? So I've taken a handbag, I've protected every single part that I think is authentically mine, so a particular strap, a particular twist, I've started doing that. It's not cheap, but guess what? If we don't do it, we're just gonna keep complaining. So borrow the funds, do it. Like you said, it's cheaper to protect yourself now than to defend yourself later. So just do it. All right, Shen, do you wanna say something? Okay. Uh, unfor oh Lord, unfortunately I've been asked to, to wrap up this session. I'm so sorry, I've been asked to wrap up this session because we have a workshop coming up uh, it's a leather crafting workshop, an insider's guide with Obiora Onoye, who is the founder of Obi Leather. So he's going to be doing a workshop uh, just right after this. So I'm sorry for those who still have questions. I know, I'm being asked, so I'm sorry. I see your hands, I see your hands. But maybe you can walk up to, I'm sure they will be available for you to talk to. Uh, they're still around, right? Yes, they're still around, so you can walk up to them and ask questions. But... We want to sort of wrap this up so we can move on to the next thing. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much, Ebe. Thank you very much, Shem. Thank you, Femi Olayabi. We appreciate you being so open. Thank you, we appreciate it. This has been such an exciting conversation, right? All right, thank you very much for coming. And don't forget, we have a workshop coming up next. And I think a catwalk show will also be showing out there. So do enjoy yourself and stay around. Thank you.